everyone, and welcome back to Talking Pictures. I'm your host, Tim Rosenberger, and today our topic is going to be one of the great stars of the silver screen, Humphrey Bogart. Here to discuss him with me is the founder and runner of a totally Bogart-centric movie blog, which you can find at bogeyfilmblog.wordpress.com. He is the wonderful Jason Taylor. Jason, thanks for being with me today. Thanks for having me, Tim. I appreciate it. When did you first become aware of Humphrey Bogart? Probably early to mid high school. I think culturally, I can remember him as far back as a little kid, but I don't think I'd really watched a movie or appreciated his work until high school when I sat down with my mom one night while she was watching Casablanca and watched that film with her and had her kind of explain to me who he was and what his place in Hollywood was and what some of his other movies were. So it was probably early 90s, probably is when I first started taking an interest. But I think he's pretty hard to miss just culturally. I'm trying to remember the timing, but I'm sure I've seen him in some commercials because they see GI'd him into a few commercials early on. But no, the first movie I saw was probably Casablanca in 92 or 93, somewhere in there. And what were your initial thoughts about him? I think that was the first classic film I'd sat and watched the whole thing through, other than some old Abbott and Costello stuff, or I think I'd seen some Marx Brothers stuff by then. But that was the first film that I thought, oh, wow, I think I really am missing out on a big part of Hollywood history by writing off any movie that's in black and white or older than 1960-something, whatever. Just watching that movie, it was pretty clear to me that there was something transcendent about him and his performance and that film. It's obviously a classic for a reason, but he just wasn't your typical Hollywood leading man even for that time. I think that's kind of like when you watch any movie and you see an actor you like for the first time and you kind of just want to search out some more stuff that they've done and see if everything holds up to that first performance. You said he wasn't like a typical leading man at that time. What made him not so typical? Well, I don't think he was probably a typical leading man for any time. I think in the modern day, there's a lot of guys who don't necessarily fit the norm of what a leading man is. And it wasn't until later I realized how atypical he was. He's standing up next to somebody like an Errol Flynn or a Cary Grant or even Jimmy Stewart. He was short. He was pretty scrawny. He was older than most leading men are in a lot of the films that he was starring in. He just had kind of a sad and grizzled kind of hangdog look about him. But at the same time, there were, especially with that film, there was this huge confidence and swagger that I think is part of the charisma, part of that X factor that goes into making any star iconic. Somebody that people just look at and go, that's somebody I should be staring at. Somebody that's hard to take your eyes off of when they're on the screen. So later on, as I studied his life and was reading books and watching documentaries about him, I kind of came to learn how he kind of broke through and got his place. And that a lot of the, the men who would be leading men at that time were off fighting a war. And he was kind of taken because he had experience and looked good enough to be on the screen. But it took a couple of real solid breaks for him to become the leading man that he was. I just don't think at that time, unless you were six foot and blonde and a large authoritative figure, were you able to be a leading man? And he was able to kind of break through that and get past the character actor and the B-movie gangster stuff he'd been doing for a long time to kind of make his mark on Hollywood. When did you really start watching his films in a big way? As I went on after that film, I I asked my mom, who was my authority at the time, and this was pre-IMDb, what else can I watch of his? And she gave me the obvious ones like Maltese Falcon and Big Sleep and High Sierra. And so I would say over the next probably 10 to 15 years-ish, I would watch what was available, readily available. The library had most of his five or six biggest classics or the rental store would. But it was probably three or four years ago that I had time and I had a little extra cash in my pocket and I saw a sale on his big 24 film box set called The Essential Bogart and I started thinking in my mind, I wonder how hard it would be to track down everything. Because I try to watch a lot of movies and I'll go through fits where I'm only watching new stuff and I'll go through fits where I'm like trying to catch up on any classic I've missed or genre I've missed. But he was really the actor that if I'm just home on a Saturday night alone and I want to watch something entertaining or soothing or something to fall asleep to, he's the one I would go back to quite a bit. So I thought I'd like to really try to see everything that's available from him. So it was probably three or four years ago. I just started renting, ordering, tracking down, emailing, calling, just trying to find everything I possibly could that he ever put on film and then eventually radio. And it took me about a year and a half to get everything that's available to the public. And were there any surprises for you when you were starting to really delve into his work, especially some of the more lesser known stuff? Yeah, there's quite a few films of his that are hard to track down and... I'd read pretty bad things about, or there just was hardly anything written about. I think my initial goal was I want to find more films that give me the feel that Casablanca did, even if it's not a war drama, just something that I could watch and go, wow, this guy really knew his stuff, or he's really displaying his talents. And so you find these B-movie pre-iconic, 
iconic Bogart films that I came across. Like Return of Dr. X was an early one I found that I'd read just terrible things about, but ended up being a lot of fun. He did a series of movies with Betty Davis where he played gangsters that were just a lot of fun. There's, a, there's just a lot of stuff out there that doesn't get replayed on TCM a ton or isn't available to rent unless you get a hold of one of these big box sets. There was Deadline USA was one of his later ones I found that just hasn't been available on DVD for years. And then they finally just released it within the last six months. I think TCM released a box set with some more of his later films, The Harder They Fall, Sirico, and then an early one, Love Affair. There's tons of stuff, just a treasure trove of stuff out there that I was kind of surprised hadn't been released or hadn't been publicized greatly other than the five or six that kind of repeat on TCM or that they play every single year when they do their Bogart marathon or whatever. For those who don't know, Bogart really came into prominence and really started becoming a star in the early 40s. I mean, really, I think High Sierra was his big break, but I mean, he was doing films all throughout the 1930s. I mean, what do you think of that early work? I have a hard time separating myself now from being objective. Started on Broadway and then had a couple false starts in Hollywood and then went back to New York and then ended back up in Hollywood. And he's in The Petrified Forest, which everybody thinks is going to be this kind of breakout role. And then he ends up making a bunch more B-movies. Some of that early stuff, I think if you take it with a grain of salt and you say to yourself, this is Hollywood's biggest icon, I'm going to find something good here. More often than not, you'll be surprised. There are a couple real rough clunkers that are hard to even rewatch, but I would say almost all the early stuff there's amazing moments and he talked a lot in interviews about this film was horrible or I hated this one or they forced me into this one but even in a lot of the early films that he starred in even the duds he was on 100% he was not holding back there's certainly plenty of good Bogart qualities on display I think his earliest one available is Up the River with Spencer Tracy, where he's a prisoner and it's kind of a love story. And then he's in one with Betty Davis called The Bad Sister. There's a couple of those early ones where he plays like the young leading man that the girls are supposed to fall in love with. And it's so incredibly different than what most people think of him as, as the gangster or the tough guy or, you know, Rick Blaine from Casablanca. And then he has a couple early ones, too, where he's a factory worker, kind of against immigrants coming in and taking her jobs. It's a pretty timeless film that I think should be a bigger classic than it is, especially in modern times times but i think there's plenty of stuff to love in those early films but it can add a lot more emphasis to just the power of some of those later movies when you've seen the early ones and you've seen him portray so many either young lovers or young gangsters or young reporters or lawyers or all that stuff dead end is one of those earlier ones kid galahad petrified forest certainly there's a few of those that i would think casual to hardcore classic fans would say are classics that are probably lesser known and then some of those early ones too are hard to find because they're just terrible like he did a couple cow Cowboy films like A Holy Terror, which it took me forever to track down. That's just, he's miscast. It's not a great fury. And maybe one of my favorite horrible Bogart films is Isle of Fury, where he's hiding out on an island. And at one point he fights an octopus underwater with terrible special effects. I say terrible. I've watched it multiple times. I think it's like anybody. If you're a fan of any actor, regardless of how bad the film is, uh, you're going to find some good things in it. And also just their presence in it can elevate it to some sort of watchability just because they're so good it makes the whole film better sometimes yeah and several of his biographies comment that he was sleepwalking through roles and so i was just always kind of waiting to find that role where i thought oh he's just tuned out and i don't know if it was cutting his teeth on broadway on the stage or what but i don't really feel like i've ever watched a performance where i thought he was holding back or just didn't care even in his craziest roles as a cowboy or a zombie doctor or the stuff a lot of people haven't seen he seems to be playing it pretty hard he seems to be taking it pretty seriously so i'm guessing a lot of those comments he made were more out of embarrassment of please don't watch these horrible films films because he probably couldn't say I was the only good thing in this film or I tried my best but the film still stunk. One of the things I found interesting about Bogart, there was a quote from, I think it was rather John Huston or William Wyler, who said that Bogart had a very small range, but within that range, he could do a lot of great things, which I think is true to an extent. But also, I think he was capable of doing things out of that range that I think people expected him to be in all the time. Because every time I've watched one of his films, he always does something that he always does something that I don't expect, whether it be giving right. a nuance to the performance or a certain delivery of a line or he does something that kind of surprises me because usually I think of him as being kind of that tough kind of manly man type person he's often can do more than that and even in Casablanca he's playing actually a very vulnerable emotional person I mean he's still falling into that mode of man's man type guy but he is doing more than that too and I don't think he gets enough credit for that all the time 
I've heard it argued that Hollywood's most iconic actors aren't Meryl Streep, they're George Clooney and Kevin Costner and Cary Grant and Jimmy Stewart. They're the, the biggest stars are the ones who are always playing versions of themselves. And if you lined all their movies up, you'd kind of notice, well, okay, he was a bad guy here and he's a good guy here, but he's not playing them a whole lot differently. But he did a radio program. One of his early radio shows, host of the show was talking to him, introduced him actually as a young comedian, was just playing up that he was a young comedic actor new to Hollywood. And it kind of shocked me. And I don't hear that a lot. And it kind of led me down a path of realizing that when he started out in Hollywood, he actually probably had a pretty good range and was typecast pretty quickly into the gangster role, but was able to break out with Casablanca into the expat, more serious, dramatic role, the tough guy with a gun who could play by the rules, the private detective, that kind of stuff. But then you watch a movie like The Desperate Hours, where he's playing the bad guy, but it's certainly not his typical bad guy, or even the one he won the Oscar for, The African Queen. That's about as big an antithesis to Humphrey Bogart as you can get. There's no guns. He's kind of Weasley. He's kind of a coward. He's goofy. He's dorky. He's really playing up the buck teeth and the lisp. But I think you're right. I think he had a good range, but I think he also knew this is what works to get people in the theater. People don't necessarily want to see America's biggest tough guy playing too vulnerable. So while you might see vulnerable moments in films, I don't think he was probably looking too hard to find those types of roles. I'm even trying to think in my mind what roles he had were that weren't at least a little bit. Other than Black Legion and Were No Angels, he was an ex-con, but he was pretty soft. I guess a reporter role like Barefoot Contessa, he showed a little bit of a softer side, more of a fatherly side. Same with maybe like something like Sabrina. But even those guys, I think there was an underlying toughness that he wasn't ready to let go of. Part of that, I think, I'm sure, is the studio putting him in certain films to make him look a certain way. But later, when he got control of his own career, it certainly seemed like he was still trying to play up that tough guy part. Unfortunately, I think most of his biggest range is seen in those earliest films where he might be playing a young love interest or a little bit more comedic. But like you said, every film you watch, you catch something new. And one of the things that appears over and over in Bogart films that I always got a laugh out of was there's so many where he has a drunk scene and that's where he'll let a little bit of his comedic side through. But other than that, you read so many stories where he was offset privately, just the funniest guy in the room or really emotional or he just shut a lot of that off, I think, on film because that's what the audience wanted. You know, I actually think he does do comedy quite well. I mean, you don't usually think of Bogart as being a comedic actor. I probably wouldn't list him as a comedic actor, but when he does do comedy in his films and it's written well, he can pull it off really, really well. I mean, he has great delivery, he has great timing. He's really very, very good at it, and I wish he had done more. I know, obviously, once he really got into the whole kind of tough guy persona, he might have had less interest, but I think it's something that's a bit untapped for him because when he does it, he can do it really well. And I think a lot of those little moments you see in films, one of my favorites is the Casablanca scene where they're all sitting around the table and interrogating him a little bit. He's looking at their notes and asks if his eyes are really that color. And I think a lot of that was popped in by himself or, you know, on the Peter Laurie movies, there was a lot written about their real life friendship and how they would often add in lighter moments with each other just to lighten up the film a little bit. But when you hear and read about his earliest, earliest days, especially when he was in theater, I would almost guess he thought his trajectory was going to be young romantic interest or comedic lead just based on some of the stuff he was doing and some of the things he said and that radio show where he was introduced as a comedic actor and he had to know I don't look like the typical Hollywood leading man or tough guy and yet he wasn't quite as unique looking as like an Edward G. Robinson who from a very early age already looked like a grizzled old gangster so in reading some of that early stuff about him when he first came out to Hollywood and it didn't work out he goes back to New York and then he comes back again and does the petrified forest I think there was a where do I fit in how do I fit in feeling to his career where he wasn't sure what was going to click until he finally got something like High Sierra and proved that he could pull off kind of the tough guy leading man part. But beyond the way he looks and stuff, in terms of his actual acting, is there anything in particular that you think really suits him well as that tough guy, criminal type? Especially in some of those early films where he wasn't even playing a tough guy. He had a, a manner of speech that often came out as tough guy. And he kind of grew up in an affluent family and he did spend some time in the military and time in New York. But especially those early films, for whatever reason, whether it was authentic or he was trying to sound a little tough. If you didn't know anything about his history, you'd watch a few of those movies and go, well, this guy grew up in the Bronx or this guy grew up on some bad street on the south side of New York. But I also think he had an underlying intensity both on screen and off 
that was written quite a bit about where anger wasn't really too far from the surface, that he'd had enough life experience that if he needed to draw on even a meanness for a scene, that he could do it pretty easily. And whereas other actors, especially at that time before method acting and some kind of subtlety came into Hollywood, he wasn't the chew on the scenery. Like Edward G. Robinson, when he would lose his mind on screen, would be tipping things over and screaming and yelling and barking and yeah, 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 this and that. And Bogart would take the same scene and just stare at the person he was in the scene with or narrow his eyes or he had this trait where his hands would slowly raise to his hips as if he was going to draw a gun even if he wasn't carrying a gun it's a mannerism that shows up in numerous films there's a danger there with him that i think he just was able to give off an energy of this guy is a wire that's about to snap and i don't know if i want to be here when it happens and he certainly has films where he shuts that off but i think especially high sierra there's that amazing scene where he's sitting in the cabin with the two guys he's supposed to be pulling the robbery off with and he's nervous that they might not be able to keep it cool and he tells the one guy the story of the guy with his finger on the trigger of the tommy gun just going tap 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 and blowing the guy away and he plays it so subtly but the look on his face is doing more acting than the words he's using and i've heard a lot of people say that he did 99 percent of his acting from the, his chin to his forehead that his body would just hold perfectly still and he would just be able to convey everything with his face he certainly wasn't an imposing guy he supposedly wore lifts in a lot of movies in his shoes or stood on boxes to appear taller than he was or wearing enough clothes that he looked thicker than he was so there was just something with his eyes and just the way he could deliver lines quietly with a lot of intensity that i think gave him most of his authority on screen if anybody looks up his height he was not a very tall man he was not a very big man but he, he did have something about his personality that i mean i wouldn't have wanted to mess with him because he just had this <laughs> idea of you're not going to push me around he's very clear about what he wants and he'll take forceful action to get what he wants so while he wasn't terribly imposing physically he did have a personality that he was able to use on screen that really, I think, aided him in being more opposing than he might have been otherwise. There's tons of real-life stories where he loved to needle people and give them a hard time, well past the point of good taste, just to see if they could take it. And if they could take it, he had a lifelong friend. And if they couldn't take it, they would leave crying or sometimes take a swing at him. And I think that bleeds over into his film work so well that he knew, I might not be able to physically impose here, but I'm a sharp enough wit and I am can be a mean and sarcastic enough guy that I can get under people's skin within seconds just by talking to them. And the various directors he had, some did it better than others, but so many of them, I think, were able to draw on that and recognize that it wasn't the guns that that was making him tough. It was the way he could cut other people down verbally that made him come off as so convincing as a tough guy or a bad guy in films. And that kind of goes back to the comedic aspect we were talking about is that he was very good at that and he was able to use that not just for an obvious laugh but also as a character trait to have dominance in a situation or to put the person he was talking to to put them off balance and to throw them off. Right. He was able to use that in multiple ways. So he's an actor who's using his tools and his strengths very, very well. If you watch one of my favorite films to go back and just watch is The Harder They Fall, which was his last one. And I think it's a linchpin film in Hollywood. Hollywood as far as it's Bogart acting against Rod Steiger. And Steiger was definitely new school method actor. I don't care if you see spit flying from my mouth on screen. I don't care how emotionally raw I get standing against Bogart, who was definitely old school reserved. It's all behind a wall and I might let drops out here and there for you to see what's going on inside my head, but I'm not going to give it up like these younger actors are. And there are so many moments in that film where Steiger is just going nuts, chewing scenery, giving it all into a performance and they'll cut to Bogart and he's just kind of leaning backwards and smiling. And it just tells you more about what's going on in his mind than if he'd said, no, I'm going to meet your intensity. I'm going to get up right up there with you and we're going to battle it out. And he does it in so many films just with a look, take all the wind out of another actor's sails when he needed to or to show I don't need to go down to your level to win this scene. All I have to do is convey my thoughts with, with a look in my eyes or a little smile at the edge of my lips. I think that's a good point because I think usually when you think of Bogart, you think of him being very much a man of action. And I think you can sometimes remember that most of the time he's very still in his movies. He doesn't gesture a lot. He doesn't, even when he is getting angry, he might raise his voice, but he's not really doing much with his body. He's much subtler than that. But yeah, that is a good point. It is a kind of underrated quality about him. While some of his characters are more eccentric than others and some are more maybe different from what you would see every day, he isn't playing a 
big character, I think, a lot of the time. No, and I think even consider Casablanca, which is probably the one everybody's seen, that's one of his least tough guy roles. It's alluded to multiple times during the film that he sticks his neck out for nobody. He's found this little hole to hide in. He doesn't like violence. He doesn't like getting in the middle of things and everything there is, is just done with words until closer to the end of the film. But no, there's certainly, he had a handful of mannerisms, the hands at the hips. He'd tighten his lips and grit his teeth a little bit. His eyes would narrow and then he'd just lean forward a little. And in a lot of movies, that's about as animated as he got. He did some courtroom dramas where he might do a few more lawyer type tropes where he'd yell or wave his hands around or some of the reporter roles a little bit, the same stuff. But especially a lot of those early gangster roles, it was a lot of seething in the corner, narrowing of the eyes, flashing a gun around, and he didn't have to do a whole lot else. Well, even in something like the K Mutiny, where he has the oh, the, yeah, the, geez, thing, yeah, the, the thing with the, the is it marbles? I'm forgetting. Yeah, yeah. Where he's just, he's, he's, he's just he's not doing that, I think, in a really obvious way. He's just kind of doing it while he's talking. He's not drawing a lot of attention to it. You talk about your unusual Bogart roles, too. That was the first one I remember. I saw that one in college with a film club. I'd gotten it on a reel-to-reel and projected it on the big screen. And I thought, oh, i got to go check out this Bogart film I've never seen. And I, I just remember seeing it the whole time going, okay, when does he win? When does he prove that he was right? And I left after the first viewing a little unsatisfied. Going, well, that's not the Bogart I showed up to see. It, it took me a while to appreciate some of the risks he took in that film. But yeah, he's totally paranoid, conniving, strange. I mean, I... <laughs> I've had numerous bosses over the years that I've reflected back or even gone back to watch that film uh, just because it's just a classic example of somebody in power slowly losing their mind through paranoia. But that, yeah, I totally spaced that one off as a, a atypical Bogart role that's about as untough, unglamorous as you can get. And yet still at the end, without spoiling anything, there's a couple scenes there that lead you to think I've even judged him too harshly. Even after all the craziness you've seen him put his crew through, he's still able to draw it back in and the other actors around him are able to drop back in a little bit to, to leave him as a sympathetic character, which I don't think was easy for that role because he comes off as pretty nuts as Captain Quig. I think something that really works for that, though, is while, he, yes, he has played tough guys before and he has played guys who are doing things that aren't maybe necessarily... Even if the ultimate goal is something morally right, what he's doing to meet that morally right goal is not terribly right. But in that, he's not really <laughs> being a good person at all. And I think the fact that you're not used to that, maybe as an audience member, you're used to him being ultimately, in a weird way, in the right. To see him in a film where he's not doing that, it can make the performance even more surprising. It can make what he's doing even more shocking than it might have otherwise. I think every movie until then had tried to make you root for him. He was always the bad guy in the movie that you're like, well, if he wins or if he kills a few people along the way, I'm not going to be too upset. Trying to think back if there was anything before that where he played somebody just that unsympathetic for such a long time. I especially think of that last courtroom scene where they're talking to him. And I haven't read much about his personal involvement in what happened there, but there's a lot of close-ups right at the end where they're on his, what he would have referred to as his bad side with the scar on his lip. And he just doesn't look good on screen. Even somebody of his stature you're letting that happen and saying yeah no get all my flaws here i want them to see that i'm really cracking wasn't what you're going to get in almost any other bogart film maybe until african queen i don't think he played somebody that different because he was pretty sympathetic in african queen but i don't think he really shed his tough guy persona or you're going to root for me hero expatriate as much as he did in that one and then there's always treasure of the sierra madre which is probably as close as he came to queen again those are pretty similar characters of uh, power hungry guys who kind of let paranoia overtake them but i think those are the exceptions to the rule of just show he probably had a lot more range than what he was giving in all of his earlier films. Having seen so many of his films, and you've talked a little bit about kind of some stuff that may have surprised you with his work, is there anything in his work that you think other people might find surprising or that they may not know about? Or is there anything about his career that might be surprising or the types of films he might have done that people who may have only seen a few of his films or maybe not have seen any of his films and only know kind of a very basic idea of Humphrey Bogart, that they might be surprised to know about. From everything I've read at that time in Hollywood history, you were under contract with a studio and you did what they told you to or else they cut you loose. And he was one of the early, like I think of somebody like Betty Davis who kind of gave the studio trouble and the studio would look back at her and say, we'll, we'll get another girl. Bogart, on the other hand, was not afraid to say, this is stupid. You're not giving me enough money. The script is terrible. I'm not coming into work. And then he'd just leave and they'd have to soothe it over with him. The Warner guys would have to call him up and convince him to come back. 
maybe one of the most interesting things I've read about him was there's a movie by a lady named Sherry Beeson, who, or Bison, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, where she kind of wrote about the origins of film noir. And what brought him to his fame was the fact that Hollywood was just desperate and that film noir came about because the war was on everything was being rationed. Electricity was in short supply. You weren't supposed to use it at night. All the young leading men were shipped overseas and you were left with guys like Bogart who wanted to help in the war but were a little too old or physically unable who were left at home. And so she makes a really good case that there would have been no Bogart. Like we know him, he would have just been another character actor, mostly in B-movies, if it hadn't been for World War II and Hollywood's desperate need. It's called Blackout. World War II and the origins of film noir. Just the turn of events that he he was kind of left behind when all these actors went to war, all these writers, all these directors. That's when he started getting some of his bigger, more interesting breaks. That film noir came out of that American paranoia of the other and the fact that everything had to be dark and more shadowy just because they couldn't afford or weren't allowed to have the lighting. And that all these interesting faces, crooked and scarred and strange, were finally allowed to be put on screen because some of the more handsome guys weren't available anymore or they were in very short supply. And just the whole tone of movies got darker because you had a world that was war, you had soldiers coming home who were traumatized by war and that led to a lot of the crazier stranger more dream sequence portions of some of those early films so that's something i don't hear talked about a lot i hear leslie howard got him in petrified forest and that kind of took him off or george raft turned down two or three big films because he didn't want to play gangsters that bogart knew were good films and he kind of jumped in the void and filled but i don't hear i think sherry beast really makes a case that at that point in our history especially in hollywood he was the actor that we needed and he was the actor that we were stuck with and it was just a confluence of these wonderful coincidences here and there that led us to seeing Humphrey Bogart as we know him today, that he might have disappeared after High Sierra, or at least finished out in a string of B-movies, if it hadn't been for Hollywood being stuck or having to rely on him around that time that film noir was coming into itself. I asked you to come up with some suggestions of some Bogart films that you thought were underappreciated or that you wanted to draw more attention to. What was the first one of those? The first time I saw All Through the Night, which came out in 1941, I was pretty blown away that this was a more well-known movie. A lot of people have heard of it, but I don't think a lot of people have seen it necessarily. And it's he worked with this director, Vincent Sherman, on five films. Two of them, Sherman was the writer. He wrote the screenplay, was a dialogue coach, and then he ended up directing three. And uh, Sherman was this really interesting guy that I haven't fully figured out yet. I haven't watched enough of his films yet, but he was a director who seemed to be trying to take a lot of real cliched Hollywood genres and spin them around and almost put a comedic spin on him. And the first one I saw of those was All Through the Night, where Bogart's this tough gangster, although doesn't seem to even own his own gun. He only has a gun when he steals one from somebody he's beating up. But it's a gangster fighting the Nazis film that has just a huge cast, including Peter Lorre, and I think maybe my favorite Peter Lorre role as this piano-playing Nazi gangster who bumps off Bogart's favorite cheesecake maker in the first 10 minutes of the film. That kind of puts the whole thing on a roll of New York mobsters versus Nazi spies in New York City. But uh, Jack Jackie Gleason's in that one and Frank McHugh and William Demarest and Phil Silver shows up as a goofy waiter and it's just a ton of funny stuff. Judith Anderson, who people, if they know her, will probably know her from uh, Rebecca as sure. uh, Mrs. Danvers. She plays a yeah. part in this as well. Karen Verne, I think this was the movie she met and married Peter Lorian. And I've seen this film now, I don't know how many times, dozens of times. It's the one I go back to if I just want to tune out and enjoy something. And it's dramatic. It has laugh out loud moments all around. I think it's just a good film that not enough people have seen. I knew it was an early 40s movie, and I checked the dates of it, yeah. and it was pretty much almost just after the right. Pearl Harbor attacks. So it is very much in that early golden age of Hollywood wartime film, rallying people against the Nazis. Hey, was, hey if, if New York mobsters can put aside their differences to fight the Nazis, then I think we all can. Exactly. exactly. Because that's, that's one of the big things, is there's kind of two competing groups of gangsters in town, and at the end, Bogart's able to get both groups together to go have a big fist fight with the Nazis. It's also interesting because there's a lot that's been written about Hollywood shortly before that time was getting a lot of flack for making gangsters look good, and a lot of actors were then forced into roles on law enforcement side to kind of tamp down. We're not glorifying criminals here, but this one certainly, if nothing else, makes it look like being a, a New York gangster is a lot of fun, just goofing around and occasionally punching out Nazis. One thing I was surprised by by this, or maybe not surprised by, but I found kind of funny, was that in his films like uh, The Maltese Falcon, he's playing a detective who technically is on the right side of the law, but he's 
playing the role kind of like a tough guy gangster. And then this film, right. I think he's technically a promoter, but he's kind of, in a way, a gangster type person. But, he, <laughs> but he's playing that role in a very kind of wholesome way. I mean, he loves his mother. He gives oh, money yeah. to people freely. He's a very kind of nice person. So I just found that kind of funny <laughs> that when he is playing more of a gangster part, at least in this movie, he's actually being a better person. <laughs> Yeah, I think it goes back to Vincent Sherman, the director, going, okay, we're going to have a lot of fun with it. Because this could have been a, a very serious gangsters versus Nazis film. And he certainly doesn't play that way. There's so much happening that's tongue in cheek. But it's interesting, too, because I think when I originally wrote this up on the blog, I talked about how much he is kind of playing a detective in this film. And whatever his job is, is not made clear. He's referred to as a gambler, as a promoter, as a gangster. I think the poster for this one had him New York's toughest gun or something like that. And he goes and inspects the crime scene at the beginning he tracks down suspects he kind of goes undercover with the nazis for a little bit towards the end he's playing with so many different aspects of bogart's career that i had to think vincent sherman knew what he was doing or knew he was leaving kind of a trail of okay here's bogart the detective here's bogart the gangster here's bogart as the loving son here's bogart as the guy who walks into the nightclub and falls in love with a girl so i have a theory that vincent sherman knew what he was doing and was kind of ahead of his time as far as spoofing hollywood genres at the moment since it is partially a comedy, if people are looking for one of those kind of wartime thriller films where people are fighting against Nazis, but they want a lighter version of that, this is kind of right. a good way to go. Because you get some of that really dramatic stuff, but you also, there's a lot of levity to it, and it's not as dramatic as some of the other stuff that you might get from around that time. People have asked me, okay, if I'm going to watch it, how would you describe it? And I kind of say the Coen brothers had been directing movies, late 30s, early 40s. This is the kind of film, kind of that tongue in cheek, but oh wait, people are also dying. Some serious stuff is going on here. Just kind of a dark, fun, goofy mix of stuff going on. There's another film that you suggested that is very much unlike this one, and you talked about <laughs> his B-movie roles, yeah. and maybe talk a little bit about that one. Oddly enough, another Vincent Sherman directed film called The Return of Dr. X, which was a sequel, to, but not a sequel to another horror film called Dr. X. I'd read just an incredible amount of bad press about this. I'd read interviews where he just trashes this film. I was so ready to hate this thing that when it showed up, I think I got it through Netflix, I just kind of prepared myself to watch it as if I was going to the den or something. This is not going to be fun, but I need to do it. I need to sit through it. And I ended up having a ball with it, especially at the time. I think Vincent Sherman said, I'm not making a horror movie. I'm going to break the genre a little bit and make a comedy movie that has horror elements. And even the cast, he has this kind of big blonde dopey guy named Wayne Morris, who films were trying to turn into a leading man at that time. And Dennis Morgan, who looks and acts in this film as if he just came off a general hospital. It's a very soap opera performance. And Bogart actually is one of the supporting characters. He's not even the lead mad scientist. He's like the mad scientist. He's kind of the Igor in the film, the guy who shows up occasionally with a rabbit in his hands and a white streak through his hair and talks really creepy. And it's goofy and it's fun and it's an hour and two minutes long. And the moment I watched it, I watched it again back to back. It gets a real bad rap. And I think it gets a bad rap because people hear, oh, it's a horror film where Bogart plays a monster. And if you go into it thinking that, you're going to be disappointed. If you go thinking, oh, this is a comedy horror film where he's playing a Bela Lugosi type monster, but it's all tongue in cheek. I think you have a lot more fun watching the film, especially when you so you have Wayne Morris, who's the star. He's a reporter. And Dennis Morgan, who's this doctor trying to figure out why people are dying and then coming back to life. It feels a lot like a comedy episode of The X-Files, I guess. And I think if you go into it with that mind frame it's so much more enjoyable i watched plan nine from outer space in the theater with friends in college i got that it was silly and ridiculous but i couldn't become like a typical cult fan but this movie is like that but it's actually well made the script is terrible but vincent sherman is a great director and bogart and wayne morris and dennis morgan and rosemary lane is the nurse in it very capable actors very capable director taking a really terrible script and having a lot of fun with it i haven't met that many people who've seen it i make it like in my annual tradition around halloween it's a kid-friendly movie too so my sons will watch it and just be like this is ridiculous but at the same time there's a monkey they give the reporter and the doctor guns at the end it doesn't make any sense it's a goofy wonderful mess that's directed very well and an hour and two minutes i mean what are you losing just from the start, it's really ridiculous because, I mean, as a journalist, the fact that this guy, uh, he's supposed to interview somebody and he goes to her place and he finds her dead body there or supposedly dead yeah. body. And he doesn't call the police. <laughs> he just is like, oh, hey, we can get a good story out of this. And then the police, I guess, find out about it through <laughs> yeah. the story he writes, yeah. which is like, 
I'm, like, I'm thinking like I'm pretty sure even in 1938 or 39 when you do this that you would probably go to jail for doing that. Well, <laughs> so, I, there's, there's this wonderful scene where they kind of discover Bogart's character of Kane might be involved in this. And they're like, well, he can't be involved. He was executed. Well, how do we know for sure? Well, we got to go to the cemetery and dig him up. And Dennis Morgan, who's this respected surgeon? She's like, yep, let's go do it. And he's like, yeah, I know the guy at the cemetery. Like, it's all just matter of fact. There's so many points in this film where anybody should have just stopped and said, does anybody realize what we're doing here? This is all so absurd. But nobody does. Everything is just played completely like, nope, this is normal. We're all going ahead with this. The doctor's supposed to be going on a date with Rosemary Lane. And he's like, well, I got to go dig this body up now. He doesn't want to break the date. So instead, he leaves her in the car for the entire evening um, while they're running in and out of cemeteries and hospitals and all kinds of places. And she's like, totally fine with it. Like, yep, no problem. I would have just been sitting at home tonight anyway. Even though there are killers running around killing and reanimating people, it's totally fine to leave her in dangerous situations. And then without spoiling anything, there's a shootout at the end where I think Vincent Sherman just said, okay, you're no longer the undead zombie. You're now Duke Mantee and you're in this cabin and authorities are coming and they give, I think both the reporter and the doctor are given guns by the cops. It sounds absurd and it is absurd, but it's just done so well i have a real soft spot for it um, and, and, and again i'll make the point how many other famous hollywood actors of this time played this type of role i would equate it to Cary grant playing frankenstein or jimmy stewart playing dracula or james cagney playing the swamp thing it's just such a rare weird little movie for him to have been plugged into that i just have to think we need to cherish it while we have it and not examine it too closely but yeah, I think one thing that really works for it is the leads, the reporter and the doctor, because what sometimes can really drag B-movies down a lot is, one, even yeah. though they're usually pretty short, there can be a lot of padding in there, and they can move painfully slowly. This one moves at a very brisk pace. It's really kind of fast going. But also, the two leads are, I think, having a lot of fun with what they're doing. They're not the best actors in the world, but they're not bad actors, and they're very charismatic, and they make their parts work really well. You enjoy spending time with them instead of being forced to watch what can sometimes be very cardboard, cut out, boring, wholesome B-movie actors. There was one last Bogart film you wanted to mention. It's one of his later films, I think 1951, I want to say. What is that one? I think this one sticks out for me. It was another one of those. I'd heard a lot of his, or especially his last six or seven films, the quality started dipping. His health wasn't doing well. He was producing a lot of the films on his own, and he wasn't necessarily the most business-minded, or he wasn't nearly as good at producing as he was at acting. So watching a lot of these films, especially after he broke away from Warner Brothers, for the most part, I think a lot of the criticisms are right. They're not amazing films. There's a few real gems, like The Harder They Fall, that pop up that I go, oh man, that's just good stuff, The Desperate Hours. But this film, at the time, got a lot of negative attention because people kind of thought it was another version of Casablanca they were trying to cash in on, which there are tons of similarities. But I think what's most interesting about this film, and not to veer too far off into the weeds a little bit, but Bogart spent a lot of his time and energy for a few years right in the middle of his career fighting McCarthyism and blacklisting of communists. And he came out on the other side of that fight against the government damaged. And you can see that, I think, in the characters that he's playing on film. A lot of the ones he was playing towards the end were very Rick Blaine-ish types but without the optimism, without the patriotism left deep in their bones that lets you know that they were still a hero. And I think in this one, he's gun running for the Syrian rebels in the early 20s against the French. The movie's really kind of a vehicle for Lee J. Cobb, who's playing this French colonel who's trying to stop the Syrian rebels from ending their occupation in Damascus. And Bogart, very similar to Rick Blaine, spends all of his time in this restaurant with the locals, and he's well-known and well-liked, and the government's coming in and trying to shut him down. And, but there's just a much darker tone to his character of Harry Smith than what he played in Rick Blaine. It's kind of a darker side to the coin that he played in Casablanca, I guess. He was one of the ones on the TCM box set that I got. And Ben Mankiewicz gives a really good introduction to the film where he talks about the criticism it received at the time being compared to Casablanca, which is really unfair because the tone is so totally different. I don't know if it was even intentional. I think he was subconsciously playing the characters a lot darker, a lot sadder. And if you're going to double feature two Bogart films on a night, Casablanca and Sirico wouldn't be bad because they do end on such different tones. The heroes are different in the story than what you would might expect when the film starts. Lee J. Cobb does a really good job. He has this Syrian buddy named Nasir, who's played by Nick Dennis, and Zero 
Carol Mostel only appeared in a few Bogart films and has a small role in this one. There's a lot of great intrigue. There's a lot of back alley deals and hiding in sewer tunnels. And then I think the climax of the film when both Bogart and Lee J. Cobb are put in danger, I would even say beyond. I don't know if I ever felt that any of the main heroes in Casablanca were in real physical danger. I think the tone of that film is the good guys are going to win. And the tone of this film, especially towards the end, is I don't know what's going to happen here. And characters I care about might not make it out of this alive. And it, it's just a film that I'll see pop up on TCM once in a while or get mentioned here or there by people. But I don't think as many people have seen it just because of the bad rap it got. Kind of like you were when you saw The Cane Mutiny for the first time. I think I felt kind of similar with this in a way where Lee J. Cobb is kind of a good person, but even he does some stuff in the movie that doesn't really make you like him all that much. Right. But all the characters, there's not tons to like about them, really, I think. No, um, they're all dark and brooding and they're all sad there's not a lot of hope going on here you just feel like things aren't going to end well i don't think it's till the end when lee j cobb putting himself into danger saying whether the plan i have is going to work or not it's worth trying to avoid a bad ending the second third fourth times i watched the film i started to look at him as more of the star rather than bogart and the arc that he takes and the redemption that that kind of brings him at the end i find more impressive the more i watch it so it might be one of those films that was hurt by the fact that bogart was cast in it because it makes it hard hard to stop and pay attention to some of the other actors in the films and either root for them or sympathize with them. And the tone of Casablanca's Bogart against the local authorities. And when you put that same tone in this film, I think it's easy to forget, oh, we can feel sympathy for the French. It's okay to recognize they're not doing good things, but at the same time, we don't have to villainize them like we villainize the Nazis in Casablanca. So I do think removing it from its time period helps a lot in starting to unravel and understand what exactly is happening. But there's so many classic moments in that film where he's drinking and smoking immediately after the restaurant he's in blows up or he's getting a shave in the barber shop, or he's in a back alley doing arms deals with some shady people or he's walking through the sewers of Damascus. There's a lot of real classic. I mean, you could turn the sound off on this one and just enjoy the look of it for the whole film because the cinematography is just done really well and he looks good and he acts well. And I think the tone puts a lot of people off. Like you said, the unsympathetic characters put a lot of people off. Again, it was probably one of those films that's ahead of its time. There's a lot of films that come out now that are dark with no sympathetic characters. And you, know, you think of half the movies Clint Eastwood's directed were by the and you're just like, oh, I feel sick to my stomach. I think, I, you know, Mystic River, where I walked out and my wife goes, I don't ever want to watch that movie again. And <laughs> I kind of have similar feelings about this one, especially the first time I watched it, where I was like, what am I supposed to leave here feeling? And it wasn't until I kind of turned my attention more to Lee J. Cobb's character that I went, oh, okay, I'm just reading this film wrong. I need to look at it more from his perspective. Lee J. Cobb, I was noticing while I was watching it that it is almost more of his movie than Bogart's. I mean, it really takes, I mean, Bogart does take more of a leading role near the later portions of the film, but especially at the beginning the first half maybe even he's almost a side character in some ways it is really about lee j cobb and his character and his arc so i could definitely see that being more of his film I try to pick out who the characters were supposed to be rooting for by the end of the movie, whose arc had the most effect on the film. Even though we're kind of led to believe it might be Bogart through the whole movie, it's really Cobb at the end who who his his character development makes the biggest changes in both his superiors and, you know, the woman he was in love with and the city as a whole. I'd be remiss not to mention, I really enjoy the film The Left Hand of God, where Lee J. Cobb also appears in a terribly horrible, just ridiculous, over-the-top Asian stereotype role. That's the only reason I haven't added him to the blog in the usual suspects portion where I highlight repeat actors. Is when you compare the two movies, this one I would say he does excellent work, and in that one, it's cringeworthy. A slight detour kind of off of that of people playing different ethnicities and races and stuff than they usually do. One thing I found kind of funny in this film is that Humphrey Bogart's said to be American, but then you have people who are obviously supposed to be French, and then people who are obviously supposed to be Syrian, but all of them talk yeah. in very obvious American accents. Yeah. There's no yeah. attempt at all at doing anything at all with them. Yeah, exactly. What I'm trying to think, is it Passage to Marseille, where Bogart's supposed to be French and comes off with the most English accent? There's only a couple films. He played a Spanish cowboy in one film and an Irish horse trainer in another, and I think those two were enough early on for him to go, I cannot do accents anymore. One of the things that people say brings Casablanca so much authenticity is the amount of actors in that film, down to the smallest roles, that were actually Europeans who'd fled from the Nazis during the war. And this film was directed by a guy named Curtis Bernhardt, who spent over the first half of his career directing films in Germany before he was chased out for being a Jew. Watching the film through that lens adds a lot too, because I think that adds to a much darker tone than what another director might have done with the film, that we're seeing this from the perspective of a guy who almost died for the cause in another country. An American directing this film, even a Vincent Sherman directing this film, I think it adds a lot to the tone that Bernhardt, I think, was putting a lot of himself into this film of nobody's necessarily good, nobody's necessarily bad, everybody's got gray areas. Having a director and a handful of actors who were Europeans in this film, I 
I think definitely had a tone to it, much like Casablanca, except in kind of an uglier, grayer way. To kind of speak to the tone of the film a little bit more, there are a lot of similarities to Casablanca, and this is a much darker offshoot of that. The cinematography is great, and there's a lot of great, dark, gritty locations. And I think that really works for the film, because Casablanca is very much a glossy, clean, golden age of Hollywood, a picture. And this is a much more gritty, down-to-earth, rough film it can be very pessimistic at times there is some optimism in it but it is very pessimistic in some ways it's more true to life and maybe casablanca was so in that sense i think it was very interesting and again just to see bogart in a role where he's not having this big redeeming arc or if he is right. it's not as much as in casablanca where he's really learning to care again and to listen to himself again and actually do some good again and this for a lot of the time he's just being kind of a greedy jerk and stuff so there's a lot of great stuff in it people are going into and expecting Casablanca, they are going to be disappointed because this is very different from Casablanca. But if you want yeah. to see, I think, something that's a bit different in terms of Bogart performance, in terms of just a Bogart type of film, especially different from some of his stuff in the 40s, this is a great one to go to because there's a lot of great and interesting stuff in this one. This is Casablanca if there had been no Rick Blaine. If it had just been Sidney Greenstreet's character was the only guy in town, Casablanca would have been a much darker film. I see this in a lot of way of him playing a similar type of character that Sidney Greenstreet played in that one. Just a much shadier version of Rick Blaine. A much less redeemable version of Rick Blaine. When you look at the handful of films he made in the last three, four years of his life, anything that's this dramatic, that's the type of character he was playing. I don't know if there was another Rick Blaine in those last few years. Certainly any dramatic film, he played some goofy, more fun lighter characters those last few years like in sabrina were no angels beat the devil but in any serious was either a darker rick lane like this or captain queek or deadline usa was a not dark film but he, he certainly is a little less of an optimistic hero in that one than in a lot of films it's a kind of a classic example but definitely a watchable film of his last probably four or five years when he was alive for anybody who wants to see these films, I don't know all the places that they're available, but I do know the way I watched them was through either Amazon or YouTube has them. You can rent them for like three bucks. Well, I do thank you for joining me today, Jason. It was a lot of fun and really interesting conversations had. So I do thank you for taking time out of your day. No problem. I'm glad I couldn't see your eyes glaze over like my wife's do. Oh, when I start talking about Bogart. So it was nice that <laughs> <laughs> it's nice that this is an audio and not a video. Oh, so my, like, my eyes, you know, did, my eyes still, didn't glaze over that much. <laughs> Only... He's still talking about the return to Dr. X. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you all for joining us today. And we we'll hope you join me next month where the topic is going to be the Marx Brothers. I'm really looking forward to that one. And I hope you guys all join me then. So I will see you then. You can find me on Twitter at CinemaPackRats. Links to my WordPress and YouTube account where you can find film and television news and reviews can be found in the episode's description. 